Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Our guest today is Paul Graziani, the CEO of CompSpock. He is here to discuss Space Situational Awareness, or SSA, and the value of data fusion to enhance SSA by integrating multiple data sources to produce more consistent, accurate, and useful information. Data fusion is one of the processes that assists in reducing vast amounts of data into more usable information that supports insight for space situational awareness. Paul, thank you for being in the podcast to talk about this technique, which seems to be improving every day. Now, Paul, we're going to jump right in here. What sorts of data and visualization are needed for good SSA? Uh, well, John, first off, great. I have to say, great setup there. That was really, I think you identified a bunch of the key points that'll uh, make an interesting conversation here. But yeah, I think there is, there's uh, all sorts of different data. And I maybe we should start by just defining what we mean, because that word could mean almost anything. It's very generic, as you know, and maybe the same thing on visualization. So for our purposes here, I think a great definition of data is really what we're talking about is metric observation data that's input to the SSA process. So that's the data we're talking about. It's kind of input at the beginning of the process. Visualization, as you uh, mentioned here, uh, that's something that happens after data gets processed in a way and a human can take a look at it and then understand more about it. So I would just wanted to give that, that definition of terms. Uh, I would say uh, there are a few other areas that are very relevant too. So sh we should talk about once that data comes in, it gets processed, those metric, metric observations get processed into orbits. N another section is uh, looking at that data and looking for maneuvers, for instance, characterizing maneuvers. And then, uh, then you propagate forward, and from that uh, forward look of uh, ephemeris propagated forward, we'll take a look at that data and look for things like conjunctions or predictive maneuvers or, or predictive reentry. But so back to your, but your question, with that definition of, of what I'm talking about on data, uh, I'd say there are so many different data sources right now for space situational awareness. They vary in uh, in what's what's called the term is phenomenology so that would be it could be optical data that generally comes from telescopes it could be rf data that comes from listening to signal passive rf data i should say it comes from listening to signals that satellites transmit it could be radar where the the signal is actually uh being transmitted from the ground and then bound or from some some transmitter it could be in in space or on in the air back down to the ground so uh, all of that, that data is an important part of this, uh, this element. Those types of data uh, focused in different orbit regimes as well. So anything from low Earth orbit, and even very low Earth orbit, uh, up to the mid orbits where navigation satellites generally are, and then all the way through to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to geosynchronous and beyond now, we're talking about cislunar. So uh, that's that, you know, there, I hope to kind of paint the boundaries of, of the data that we're talking about there and where visualization comes to play. Well, we wrote down propagate forward, have to write that instead of predict, come have to, yeah. different yeah. terminology means different yeah. things here. So yeah. we got this data coming in, you can call it metric data, you can call it, what it, let's call it data for the purposes of okay. argument here. Yep. So how do you vet incoming SSA data to ensure it's accurate and reliable to begin with. I mean, how right. reliable are your sources? Sounds like a Washington Post investigative reporter. Yeah. Tell, show me your sources. Show yeah. me your work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. An important uh, topic. And again, with so few words into a common, such a uh, such a complicated area, there's a lot of different ways you could interpret that. So some people might look at that and think you're talking about data security, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, hey, uh, I created data at a sensor that sensors out in the field. Uh, that data has to be transmitted, and that data could be compromised somewhere along the way. So that's that's one way that you kind of vet the data. Uh, I think re relative to the way uh, that the way I think about this and we think about it, we think more uh, of the problem of taking data from different sensors on the same object that uh, could, and you've got different different metric. Uh, observations coming in on that same object, and that that data may show different results. So now you have to take a look at it and say, "Hey, 
why are those results different on those two different sensors? It could have been, it could have been those sensors may not have been detecting the object at the same time, and it may have actually maneuvered at some particular time. Uh, that, that information could be wrong. They're, we actually had an incident, one of our data partners, what happened, they had a telescope that was set up on a balcony of a hotel, and literally the cleaning crew came in, and when they cleaned, they, they knocked out the plug in a GPS uh, that was being used for timing, and the clock started drifting, right? So all of these, reason, all, all these things contribute to, to errors, and many more that we don't have time to go into. But what, what we do in our, our, our focus on the data integrity is we put this into a Kalman filter. And so pe people that use uh, that type of algorithm for their orbit determination and the Kalman filters are fantastic. As a matter of fact, our, our technical people, they use the term, it's a, a lie detector. So when, the, when one sensor is lying about that object, it kind of pops out very clearly. And then you can go and you can dig into it and you can find out, hey, you know, your clock is clock is drifting. What's going on? You can find out that your your GPS got got knocked out or you can find out that your your sensor was was miscalibrated. So so that's that's how we think about uh, vetting the incoming data. It's making sure that the uh, that the data coming in on on uh, same on one object data coming in from multiple sensors uh, that those sensors are, are accurate and, uh, and are not uh, lying about the object. Okay, I got a book title here. I'm going to write this book. It's called Sherlock Holmes, The Case of the Unplugged Clock. There so uh, let's delve into this. So, the, so Paul is presented with the case of the unplugged clock. So let's say there are gaps in coverage, okay? Let's right. say that. So, so, how can they be, so we got a gap in coverage somehow. Right. Who knows? So how can they be addressed? Sure. So I think to, to us, the, the, the obvious answer there is lots of sensors. So that's, that, that's more sensors that are distributed and they are different types of sensors. And this plugs the various kinds of gaps that you could have. So for instance, uh, let's take uh, geosynchronous uh, observation of geos geosynchronous satellites. Uh, the, the most common means to do that is with optical, with telescopes. Uh, telescopes generally don't work very well when the telescope itself is in light. Right, so you have a gap the night that the, when the telescope's in 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 the daytime, there's a gap there. So an obvious way to fill that is with RF, for instance. So if it's a transmitting satellite, you could listen to the set signals being transmitted from that satellite. That fills that daytime gap. Um, uh, same thing if you have radar, and it's, it's it's hard. There are radars that go out to geosynchronous. Generally, that's a the radars are reserved for satellite, usually used for satellites that are down closer, but not always. So, radar is another way to fill that that daytime gap. Um, other gaps are more geographic. So, when you're talking about low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, the location of your sensor, uh, which could be a radar. Uh, generally can only see a certain area in the sky above it. And it can't see, uh, it can't, can't see kind of a, a third, let's say, of the sky because the satellites are down so close. So, uh, so there you could fill that, you need to fill that gap by having different sensors in different areas of the, of the globe. But uh, so I think it's um, different phenomenologies and, and uh, different geographic locations is the short answer to your question. Okay, let's uh, maybe take the next logical leap here. We try and collect data. We realize there may be some problems. We've patched it. We've cleaned it up. Okay, now we have a nice little clean data set to hand to a data scientist somewhere. Okay, so that's fine and dandy, but there seems to be a need to transform data into actionable information. So what kind of analytics contribute sure. to good SSA? Yep, yep. Boy, okay, again, a wide area, you know, it's funny, I think that many people might be listening to this conversation, and they might say, wow, these guys are so narrow. And of course, when we're in the business, it, it appears to be so wide, because it's, it's close to us. So to me, this question seems wide. So let me, let me, uh, again, maybe uh, divide up the, the answer here in a few ways. So it, maybe if we work backwards, so uh, how do we get, what actions might we perform? And then we can go backward to how do we get to that actionable data? That's one way to, to think about it. So one very common thing, I think it's kind of first order problem are things like uh, conjunctions that you have where two objects in space are getting too close to each other, too close for comfort. And there, uh, we're, uh, usually if, if one or both of those objects ca are capable of maneuvering, you want to maneuver one of those. 
So, uh, so if we work backwards, the action we want to take is a conjunction avoidance maneuver. Then we'd look back. What do you What do you need to know? How do you get the How do you transform the data from a, a raw observation into the actions that you the actionable information you would need for that conjunction assessment? So there, I would say the key things are you need to have uh, a trending information. So you need to have like a consistency of observation. So you can watch that conjunction over time, because uh, what will happen is sometimes what appears to be a conjunction, maybe a few days in the future, ends up not happening. So that's that's one thing that you have to do. So you have to trend it over time. Uh, another thing you need to do is to make sure that you understand the accuracy of the data, because this is an imperfect science. You never uh, almost no, you actually pretty much never have perfect information. There's always something that's that's uh, impacting your your information. Uh, and so what you, what there, what you want to make sure you, you know, is what is the uncertainty of that, uh, data that you have? So that is, um, or the term is covariance. So you understand how noisy that data is and you want to have, uh, as good an understanding of how well, you know, that object's position. So that's, that's how you get your way to knowing better conjunctions. Um, I'll give maybe another example might be a national security example where you might have uh, some sort of uh, defensive space control maneuver that you might have to do because you're feeling that your national security asset is somehow threatened. Uh, so there, the actionable information you need is uh, what is that object? So you need to have a uh, an understanding of, of, of what that object is. That's something you have to gain over a long period of time by observing it and using other sources of information. The other thing you need to know is patterns of life. Okay, that might be if uh, it could be, for instance, let's use an analogy on the water. So you could have a warship on the water that's maybe approaching another nation ship. And if it's approaching it in a reasonable way, then there's not really a threat. However, there are other ways that that ship might be approaching that is more threatening. Same thing holds in space. You really want to be able to understand the patterns of life. What represents a normal maneuver? Maybe that satellite is just going to fly by you or... Maybe that satellite is an approach, an approach to, to cause some harm to you in some way. So that's, that's how I would say you need to transform that data that you have, the raw observations we're talking about here now, uh, metric data into actionable information. Paul, I know you've been to L.A., and in L.A., they have these food trucks. and Every tiff nationality in L.A. is crazy with all yeah. And they have these uh, food trucks that they call them food fusion, like a Korean taco. <laughs> and I want to take this word fusion and incorporate it into our discussion today because you mix different things together. You never know what you're going to get. Could be good, could be bad. Right. So tell us about data fusion. So what does it mean? Is it critical to ensuring SSA systems are tracking the right objects? Do you need that data fusion? Uh, yes, absolutely. In our world, uh, the, the, everything is so complex now that's going on in space. It's just crazy. There's a huge number of objects that are, are in orbit right now. Some of them are live. Some of them are dead debris objects. There are uh, a lot of objects up, out there now that maneuver all the time. So that's another big problem. Uh, so, uh, so you, and, and then on top of that, you have uh, bad actors out there that are doing some things like uh, maneuvering their their spacecraft very close to other spacecraft. So uh, with all that going on, fusion is one of the main ways that you can deal with this problem. Basically, that means get as much information as you can from as many different sensors that have different phenomenologies. They have different times they're looking at objects. They have different geographic locations looking at objects and fuse all that together. So uh, I think that's 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 critical. And in this in this case, the, the the way I'm defining fusion is it's again taking those metric observations and fusing that information together to form better orbits. Now, other people can use that term fusion in different ways, but that's the way when I, I'm talking about fusing metric observations together to give you the best orbits you can. So we have a lot of objects out there. You implied that we know we do. So how well do current data fusion approaches address this ability to track the right objects? Yeah, that, well, it depends where you're looking about and where, which, which approaches you're talking about. I, I would say, and I think uh, very, uh, I think most of us that live in the commercial space situation awareness world would tell you that 
there are some terrific uh, commercial ver uh, um, uh, capabilities that can you know, confuse data and, and really help you figure out what is what. I would say on the, for the governments, the governments are really pretty far behind. And, uh, and I think that's very clear. It's very objective. I think the government officials all recognize it. The government, and I'm talking U.S. as well as international. Um, but uh, what, what's happening, and this is the frustration of, of the, uh, pretty much the entire commercial SSA uh, community, is that the commercial team have uh, a bunch of, of great answers here. But the government teams are, are just so focused on trying to develop, and it's actually basically reinvent what the commercial people have already done, that it's, it's, it's very frustrating. So I, I wanted to give that foundation. I would say that in the commercial world, uh, and, and a great example of this, you could take uh, right now, there's a lot of uh, great uh, commercial optical providers that are looking at geosynchronous space. There are also a lot of, uh, of, of uh, fewer but good number of RF uh, providers out there that are, that are listening to signals coming down from space. Using those two together, for instance, let's just take the example of a, a constellation. So sometimes at geosynchronous space, there's limited geosynchronous space. And so some commercial owner operators that have allocated a particular slot in geosynchronous will fly several satellites in the same orbital slot. Well, that's a dicey situation because they're flying close to each other. And if you were to only use optical, which, which optical is very nice, it gives you really nice angles. You can, you can get, and that, that's a nice part of the solution. The RF, however, gives you two real benefits on top of that. So, so one, it has a range measurement in there. And so fusing together the angles from the telescopes and the range from the RF systems is really fantastic. It gives you a much tighter solution. So one way to think about that, um, the air, so a telescope, which doesn't have range, but great angles, the, the error that you have in that would, would, would be result in like a cigar shaped, if you imagine and you use your mind to think of a telescope on the ground pointing up to geosynchronous. And if it doesn't know range, that there, there could be this long kind of a cylindrical uh, space that that object might be in because you don't know exactly how far away it is. Well, the RF has the opposite. The RF has great range, so it knows exactly where it is, in it, but it doesn't have good angles. So that, that results in a pancake type shape. Well, you, when you fuse those two together, you take the pancake that, that's pierced by the cigar shape or pencil shape, and now you know that object is just in the intersection of those two, which is a much smaller area. So that's beautiful. Then the other thing that I that I uh, that I, I mentioned earlier, the RF also has a unique signature because it knows the signature of the satellite that is coming that is that's transmitting. So you can actually get an object ID based on that. So that is is just one example of what commercial uh, companies are doing now. The governments aren't doing this because they don't have this the ability The governments, all the government software is just very old and just not up to date with what the commercial teams are doing. Well, Paul, I'm taking notes here. I got pancakes. I got pencils and I'm go. trying drawing this thing on the piece of paper I got here. Yeah. Now, does this data fusion introduce latency? And, and no. if it does, how does that impact SSA? Yeah, I, I would I would I would say no. So and again, I need, need some definitions here. So uh, the question probably is formed based on the assumption that you're waiting for some additional data to fuse in. So if if that were to happen, then yeah, you, there could be some latency that's introduced. I would say, how, however, the way we think about that problem, that you wouldn't you wouldn't think of it this way. You would think about the additional data that you're going to fuse in is just additional information. So you have whatever information you have from let's let's call it. Uh, 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 sensor one, uh, then augmented. And when data gets fused and when data is available from sensor two, it gets fused in. And so you only get better data. You're never actually introducing additional latency when you fuse that data together. So, so that's the way I think about that. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually introduce latency. It actually only helps more, more data. Actually, one of our technical guys who are really good at equations, maybe not so good at, at, at English should, more data is more better. <laughs> I like more better. I like gooder too. It's gooder yeah, than that. <laughs> yeah.
So your company's called CompSpot. We know that. Uh, and I think there's a big conference out in Hawaii called AMOS, A-M-O-S. Yeah. And you folks are going to be at AMOS where you will yeah. be demonstrating a commercial SSA ecosystem. So oh. what's meant by an SSA ecosystem? How does it work? And why should other sure. folks even participate in your little adventure? Yep, yep. Absolutely. So, uh, so it's our, you know, there's a, there are a bunch of, there are many, many companies in SSA right now, commercial companies. Uh, so some of us have been in the game, the commercial game for a long time. Others are, are new. Uh, so our view, and, and this is something that's, that, that, uh, our, our, by our experience, and there could be other experiences, a bunch of commercial companies started talking about kind of coming together and forming a complete solution for our customers. And um, it's, it's really broad and actually even goes outside of corporations. So what, by this, what we mean is there are many different aspects of space situational awareness. So we, we've talked about a bunch of them now. You've got, uh, you've got uh, you need data sources uh, for raw observations. You need to be able to transport that data in a secure way to get it to a particular source. You then need to start processing those raw observations in there's a whole bunch of breakdown of, of various different types of processing that you do to take those raw observations, turn them into orbits, to analyze maneuvers inside of that, to understand new observations. If you suddenly see something new in space, where'd that come from? What is that? You've got to figure that out called uncorrelated tracks. Um, there's database work that has to be done. It's very substantial, but there's a large number of objects which are with a lot of data. Then uh, after that data gets into a database, you've got to process that and look for things like conjunctions we mentioned earlier, or there might be future um, rendezvous going on. Might be a friendly rendezvous, might be a not so friendly rendezvous. So you got to look at that. There could be analysis on that of of uh, re-entries happening, things, things that are getting so low that the atmosphere is going to pull it back in. Then you kind of go into uh, human analysis. So you mentioned visualization at the beginning of that. Um, now, that's just the operational system. So now you think about other parts of the ecosystem, there's going to be, if you, if you think of a timeline, there's got to be really early, um, like science and technology research going on. Okay, the, that's typically the domain of, uh, of, of labs. So labs need to be out there doing the early science, science technology. Then, then you have another area if you've got uh, like a re maybe a little bit later than the early science and technology, uh, you've got the applying that into systems. So that's later stage where there might be, um, uh, let's say some government contractors that are, that are doing that. Actually, I forgot one. Should've, I should have named the beginning DARPA. So like DARPA, they're, they're supposed to be like 20 years out, right? Uh, things that, that are seem like fantasy at the moment. So DARPA, then you've got the labs, then you might have academia kicking in, right? Where they're doing different research with, with, with uh, professors or PhD students. Um, then you, then I, I, the next, next realm I go into is uh, government contracts where there isn't a commercial, there isn't a commercially viable a, a, a solution yet, but government contractors can be there, paid by the government, who can who who aren't who are uh, the risk is being borne by the taxpayers, not by any one corporation, and they could spend the great sums of money that have to be uh, spent to to be able to get through uh, those risky areas. Okay, then after that comes the commercial companies because now uh, once the uh, once the the government contractors have burned down the risk. And maybe a market is formed. You get the government. You get the you get the commercial uh, companies coming in there, and then lastly, you have the commercial users coming in there. So to me, that was what I would describe like as as the ecosystem there, all those different players, and what we're really keen to do. And there's a bunch of other commercial companies are are keen to do this as well, is to create that ecosystem where at the end of the day, all those piece parts can come together to serve the mission at the end of the day. The mission is, you know, we need to have uh, a space domain where, where, where it's, everything is, is protected, you know, it's detected first, protected, uh, characterized, and, and, um, and, and managed and coordination going on. Like all of those, those things have, have to go on. And there are so many different uh, pieces of that companies and government contractors and labs and academics and 
So that is the, the ecosystem that, that we're talking about here. And if the commercial companies can come together and, and formulate this, and this is, again, what we're doing, these conversations, then we're going to end up collectively serving that mission that much better. You know, I think you articulated this whole concept of an ecosystem and you went line by line by line. And and what I noticed, because, you know, I'm so perceptive, is that many of these organizations are comprised of humans. <laughs> oh. And, you know, when you, you get this word collaborate and humans and, um, you know, it, it uh, I've seen many things happen over the years with humans and want to crop and, you know, yeah. so we get a wide variety of people here. So, so what's this all going to look like for the sale industry? Some people are going to play within a line. Some people aren't, or how's yep. this, what's it going to look like? Exactly. And uh, you're kind of seeing that to some degree, right? They're all humans are whenever humans are involved, <laughs> you've got, you know, it's, it gets messy real quick with humans. Uh, so uh, what I think what we're seeing in the, in this, and I'll, again, I'll parse some words here. So the satellite industry itself, I would, I, the term, I would use that term to be, uh, the, the folks that are flying satellites that could benefit from space situational awareness, right? So for them, um, they're looking at all this and in their worlds, for the most part, they've got the economics of their companies that they're worried about. And generally, there are not great economics in the satellite business. If you look at, you can see this in the news now, uh, you know, the commercial uh, geosynchronous communication satellite business right? That there, there, there are companies there that tremendous investments and they're hoping to get those investments paid back, right? But that's a lot of money and the, and the marketplace uh, isn't, isn't that great. Same things happen in the commercial remote sensing right now. So commercial remote sensing, these satellites are very expensive uh, to build, very expensive to launch, very expensive to operate, and the economics are, are not great there. So none of those, those industries in space really want to pay a lot for this uh, the, the spa- their, their various services, and they really want to rely on governments. So in my view, what it looks like to the satellite industry is that satellite industry is turning to the governments, U.S. and Europe are the, the, the countries that we deal with, primarily kind of U.S., Europe, uh, and, uh, and Asia are all kind of looking to, uh, to uh, governments providing the space situational awareness for them. That's the way I think this is really going to roll out. Oh, I think you've given our listeners a a real deep and thorough understanding of this whole issue of SSA and how it's going to change. And and uh, we'll have to keep an eye on this because there's so much going on in this whole area. Mm-hmm. I would like to thank our guest, Paul Graziani, CEO of Comspock. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review. 